Last week we looked at how human populations vary from one another, comparing contemporary groups to contemporary groups, and only briefly looking at issues of change over time. In this lecture, we'll be examining the human life cycle. We'll be looking at change within a single individual over the course of his or her lifetime. First, in understanding human growth and development, it's important to distinguish between the two words. Growth simply means an increase in body mass. Development is the differentiation of body cells into different types of tissues and their maturation. They are distinct processes that take place independently in the body. Neither process is uniform either. The rate at which infants and children grow changes almost continually throughout childhood with the most obvious change being the adolescent growth spurt that occurs at puberty. This isn't just a growth spurt, of course, but also a developmental spurt when the child's body develops into one capable of reproduction. To understand how an evolutionary perspective can help to understand patterns of growth and development, let's look at one aspect of the human body that doesn't change much during the growth spurt, the brain. By the time of the growth spurt, the brain has almost completed its growth. Now, unlike most mammals, most of the human brain's growth occurs after birth. Most mammals are born with brains roughly half the size of their adult volumes. We're born with our brains approximately 25% the size of an adult brain. So the cranial capacity of an anatomically modern adult human was roughly 1300 to 1400 cubic centimeters. That makes the ca cranial capacity of a newborn roughly 325 to 350 centimeters. That's still a very large brain for a primate and compared to the body mass, it's huge, which is why babies and children have such large heads. The brain's mass doubles in the first six months after birth to half of its adult size. By age three, it's reached 80% of its adult size. Then growth slows dramatically so that by age 10, it's reached 95%. Skeletal growth will continue until about age 20, but in that second half of the period of skeletal growth, the brain adds only about 5% of its adult mass. So proportionally speaking, we're born with very small brains, that then grow very rapidly so that the brain growth is done in half the time of the rest of the body. Well, what might be some evolutionary explanations for this pattern? One explanation is bipedalism. It requires a narrow pelvis to move the legs under the uh, mother's body. So a more developed human brain, 50% of its adult size, couldn't fit through the mother's birth canal. Were we to follow the normal mammalian pattern, mother's pelvises would prevent them from either walking upright or giving birth. Another explanation is learning. Humans are uniquely selected for learned behavior and having the brain grow most of its mass while in a stimulating environment outside of the womb may help uh, to develop the type of organization necessary for effective lifelong learning. In line with that, note that by the time a child is 10 years old, when brain growth is effectively complete, he or she should already know a great deal about daily life tasks and basic social behaviors. Of course, genes play a role in how quickly and in what ways we grow and develop. Mendelian traits like blood type or albinism, for example, will express in the phenotype regardless of the environment. For polygenic traits, our genome sets a range of potential variation, and our interactions with the environment determines where within that range we fall. For traits with continuous phenotypes, therefore, the, the environment is extremely important in our development. But first we need to figure out which environment. For those polygenic traits, there are two steps to creating a phenotype. The second step is developmental acclimatization, where the environment in which we grow up determines where within the range of potential traits we fall. But in the first step, 
the processes of natural selection create a genome that sets the range of potential phenotypes that can work in the environment. But those two environments, the one we grow up in and the one our genome is adapted to, may be very different. Because evolution is so slow, there's often a long lag between a change in the environment and the corresponding change in the gene pool of a population. Our gene pool today is the result of adaptation to the ancestral environment, not the current environment. To understand why we have certain genes today, we must look to our evolutionary ancestors. Nutrition, what kinds of foods do we need to grow and develop properly, is one of the easiest places to see the importance of the ancestral environment. Without the proper nutrition, proper growth and development is impossible, regardless of what our genes say. If we think of our genome as a set of blueprints for building our bodies, then nutrients are the building materials. We can never build a decent house with the wrong materials, and we can never build a strong body without the proper nutrients. So what kinds of nutrients do our genes expect us to have available? In fact, the sorts of nutrients that humans require reflect very well the ancestral environment in which our ancestors evolved. Those ancestors lived in a warm, dry environment where they ate relatively small amounts of a wide variety of foods, what nutritionists call a broad spectrum diet. Their diet was comparatively high in animal protein, but since these were wild animals, low in fat. Our ancestors also ate lots of complex carbohydrates in plant foods, but very little salt. Because our ancestral diets were low in fats and salts, but those nutrients are essential for proper nutrition, we also evolved to think those foods are tasty. When our ancestors found them, they gorged themselves, storing fats and salts in their body for future use during the long periods when none were available. Fast forward a few thousand years. Now, in the industrialized West, we still have that basic biology in an economy where fatty and salty foods are available in almost any quantity you want. They still taste good, so we naturally eat a lot of them. Our bodies still store the fats and salts, but there's no longer any shortage. So we keep eating and storing more and more, and the result is too much of a good thing. Meanwhile, because we're eating so much of that type of food, we eat less of others, missing many nutrients that our ancestors would have gotten regularly. In fact, because of the combination of our evolution and the modern economy, our diet today is almost the exact opposite of our ancestral diet. It's very narrow spectrum. That shift away from the ancestral diet began with the rise of agriculture, which happened earliest about 10,000 years ago in the Near East. Grains like wheat and barley were domesticated first, and with their sudden abundance, diets shifted from comparatively high in animal protein to almost completely grains. This led to the first widespread appearance of malnutrition in human history, still very visible in Neolithic skeletal remains, and a general decrease in life expectancy. Why? Well, their biology was still looking for the ancestral diet, but not getting the sorts of nutrients it needed for proper growth and development. Neolithic populations are generally a bit shorter than their hunter-gatherer ancestors for this very reason. This is what anthropologists mean when they refer to diseases of civilization. Because of the disconnect between our current and ancestral diets, our public health is much less robust than our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Hunter-gatherers simply didn't suffer from diseases like diabetes at nearly the same rate as their agricultural descendants. And the same is also true for modern hunter-gatherers living alongside agricultural communities. Of course, other factors than nutrition also play a role in development, and the book provides a great summary of several of the more important factors. You'll be responsible for that material on the exam. I won't go over it in detail right now. As you study, though, pay special attention to the concept of epigenetics. So, while growth and development are not uniform or steady processes, they are continual processes. Nevertheless, it is possible to divide that continuous process of growth and development into periods to better help us understand how and why humans grow and develop the ways that they do. 
The whole idea of periodizing human growth and development comes from life history theory. The idea that there's always a limited amount of energy available for growth and development. Energy that's used for one activity is not available for another. So growth and development is a series of trade-offs between conflicting goals. Life history theory tries to explain how and why certain trade-offs have evolved at certain stages in life. In other words, to understand why the human life history traits take the form that they do, we need to ask, how did that sequence of developmental events increase reproductive success in the ancestral environment? All organisms go through a process of growth and development, but humans are unusual in that our life cycles have so many recognizably distinct phases. Different scholars may divide things up slightly differently, but in general, the phases are prenatal, infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and the post-reproductive years. Each of these phases is marked by developmental events when the physiology of the individual changes. They start and end with these changes, and in between, different body systems are changing, all to produce the greatest number of offspring for the greatest number of individuals. Also, these phases are not only biological, but their beginnings and endings are often marked with special rituals and ceremonies, and individuals in the same life phases are often expected to follow the same sorts of prescribed cultural behaviors. These life history phases are thus as much cultural phenomena as they are biological. The prenatal period of the life cycle begins at conception and continues to birth. In this phase, the individual's own development is almost purely biological. There is a bit of cultural identity being formed. Parents pick out names for their children and friends throw baby showers so that the child is born already owning toys. Infancy is the life phase between birth and weaning, the period when, in most societies, the baby is nursing. It is often surprising to Westerners to learn that, in many societies, this phase lasts three to four years. In agricultural, and especially industrial societies, it's common to wean children much earlier than this. But in foraging societies, like our ancestral societies in which humans evolved, there's almost no food source that young toddlers can really eat other than mother's milk. Lactation also has a contraceptive effect on most women, keeping them from ovulating and becoming pregnant again until the previous child is weaned. Proper birth spacing is vital in a hunter-gatherer setting because carrying two nursing infants is extremely difficult for mothers. Having to do so means she has no hands free to feed herself. Plus, the added nutritional demands of nursing two babies may mean that the mother's own health suffers. So spacing births out enough so that only one infant is nursing at a time, and older siblings are old enough to walk alongside mom, is an evolutionary advantage for all involved. This, by the way, is a photograph of the cutest little baby ever to teach physical anthropology remotely. Moving on. Childhood is the period between weaning and puberty. This is the period during which most of a child's learning takes place, when he or she is most carefully watching and emulating the behaviors of adults. This also happens to be the time when the brain is developing most intensely. Because humans are so dependent on learned behaviors, this phase of life is unusually long for a large-bodied mammal. Unlike most mammal species, however, human children are still not sufficiently independent to feed themselves. So during childhood, parents still provision their children with food on a regular basis. This extended period of care from the parents allows the child to devote energy and attention to the more important tasks of learning. At about 10 to 15 years of age, depending on environmental factors, children enter the adolescent growth spurt, marking the beginning of the next phase. Adolescence is the period between the onset of puberty and the end of physical growth. In humans, physical growth ceases within a couple years of age 20, though this too is variable depending on genetics and environment. So adolescence lasts about five to 10 years. 
Puberty is the physical process of becoming able to reproduce. Of all the behaviors an animal will ever engage in, from an evolutionary perspective, reproduction is the most important. Making the body ready to reproduce involves a series of changes in organization in almost every system of the body, each of which must take place in a precise order and with precise timing. So puberty is a process, not an event. Nevertheless, many societies consider a girl to have entered adolescence when she has her first menstruation, called menarche. This is usually the first outwardly recognizable change in a girl's body. With boys, puberty is less obvious, but boys usually enter puberty a year or two later than girls. However, many societies mark both sexes puberty with a series of elaborate and important ceremonies. Because of cultural factors, these ceremonies might not coincide precisely with a particular person's physical puberty. Instead, they're standardized to either a certain day each year or perhaps the person's own birthday. For example, Jewish boys' bar mitzvahs take place on their 13th birthdays, and Jewish girls' bat mitzvahs take place on their 12th birthdays. Mexican girls have their quinceañadas on their 15th birthday, and the Sweet 16 party is a comparable celebration for some classes of Western European girls on their 16th birthday. If you strip off all the cultural layers of elaboration, all of these ceremonies are ultimately celebrations of puberty. Of the three examples that apply to girls, the bat mitzvah is a recent ceremony becoming popular only in the last couple generations. The traditions of quinceañada and sweet 16 go back several centuries though. And you'll notice that in these older celebrations, the age of the girl entering puberty is considerably older than the average age of menarche in Western societies today. In fact, the worldwide average age of menarche today is about 12 years old, but as little as 150 years ago, when many of these Western ceremonies were first practiced, it may have been as high as 16 or 17. Why the change? Well, firstly, we can see that this change taking place over the last 150 to 200 years is much too quick to be explained through adaptation. So the genetic boundaries on puberty haven't moved, Instead, girls are undergoing developmental acclimatization and moving earlier within the window of potential ages for menarche. Second, we can see that the trend began well before modern dietary changes like the use of artificial hormones in livestock, so that's not an explanation. But of all the changes in life phases, the one most sensitive to environmental conditions is puberty. As Western societies and worldwide societies in general have become more and more secure in their nutrition and stress levels have dropped over the last century, menarche has come earlier and earlier. In earlier times, when life was more stressful, menarche came later. So what evolutionary explanations might we offer for this? Well, earlier menarche provides the individual with more reproductive years. So individuals with a comfortable enough lifestyle would benefit by using those earlier years to rear more children. On the other hand, in a stressful environment, a young mother trying to raise a child might end up unable to support either herself or the child, meaning they both die without offspring. So early menarche would be selected against in that case. The irony is, with industrialized economies making girls' lives so stress-free, the process has actually become problematic you'll notice some of the trend lines starting to level out in the mid 20th century. And the average age of puberty today is not much less than it was 50 years ago. This is because the benefits of early menarche are now balanced against the risks. Some girls are now undergoing menarche so early that they're able to become pregnant long before the rest of their bodies are able to carry a pregnancy. This causes complications that can lead to the death of both the mother and the child. So when the dangers of earlier menarche equal the benefits, the age of menarche stabilizes. Adulthood is the life phase between the end of physical growth and the end of reproductive capabilities. 
Again, this is easier to define in women than in men because the cessation of menstruation, called menopause, around age 50 is a definite marker of infertility. Male fertility does drop dramatically around the same age. That makes for roughly 30 years of physiological adulthood. It's during this phase of life that people take on their most developed physical and cultural identities. For both sexes, much of this phase of life is devoted to raising children. Women especially will often spend much of their adult lives directly involved in child care. Because they're the ones biologically equipped to nurse infants, they often take on the cultural roles that are most compatible with child care, roles like gathering plant foods or caring for the household. These jobs are safe to have kids around and they can be interrupted when the baby needs tending. On the other hand, prior to the availability of artificial baby formula, fathers couldn't have cared for infants even had they wanted to. So in the ancestral environment, culture developed so that men took on the necessary cultural roles that were incompatible with childcare, like hunting or long distance travel. Interestingly, now that artificial baby formula is available, those traditional gender roles have begun to break down. The final phase of the human life cycle is the post-reproductive period, from the end of the reproductive years to death. Since menopause and male fertility decline set in around age 50, and because life expectancy was quite short for most of human evolution, this phase of life was usually rather short. In modern industrialized societies, however, as much as a third of one's life may be post-reproductive. This is extremely rare in the animal kingdom. Most animals remain reproductive until their deaths, though there is usually a decline in fertility with age. But why should a species evolve in such a way that for one third of their lifetime, they're completely unable to reproduce at all? Several explanations have been advanced to explain this pattern. Some scholars note that it takes roughly 12 to 15 years to raise a human child to adolescence, at which point one can be reasonably sure that they will go on to reproduce themselves. A good evolutionary strategy would be then to time the birth of one's last child to about 15 years before one's own death to make sure that the last child was fully raised. This would mean that we're evolved to live roughly 65 years, which is roughly correct. In almost all hunter-gatherer po populations, hardly anyone ever lives past that age. Another explanation is the so-called grandmother hypothesis. Non-reproductive elderly grandparents help to raise their grandchildren, serving as a second set of parents. Elderly people could choose to have more children of their own, but that's extremely strenuous on their increasingly old bodies. They run the risk of dying before their latest children are raised, and that would be disastrous for both them and the young kids. On the other hand, grandparents share on average 25% of their DNA with their grandchildren. By ensuring their grandchildren reach adulthood, and eventually produce great-grandchildren, the grandparents can also pass on their DNA to the future. Meanwhile, their grown children, by having access to high-quality childcare, are able to raise even larger families of their own. To be honest, the simplest answer is probably the best. Unfortunately, it also takes the most words to explain. Because different body systems develop at different times and rates, they also wear out at different times. In the ancestral environment, evolving for reproduction past 50 was a waste of energy because by then some other system, for example, the heart or the lungs, was likely to have worn out. In our current environment, however, modern medicine has extended life expectancy by prolonging and repairing those other systems. Medicine can't yet significantly affect the reproductive system. It still wears out at the age evolved in the ancestral environment, while the rest of the body is artificially extended to last much longer. This makes the post-reproductive phase seem much more pronounced and important than it actually was in the ancestral environment. This chapter finishes with the section looking at senescence the decline in physiological functioning usually associated with aging. That is, the kinds of changes that the body goes through as it prepares to die. 
I won't discuss it in detail here, but do read the textbook carefully. In conclusion, life history theory and the way that it periodizes the human life course helps to explain how and why we've evolved to live the way that we do. Infancy is just about surviving birth. Childhood teaches a child what he needs to know to survive in human society. Adolescence makes his body able to reproduce. Adulthood makes sure that offspring reach their own adolescence, and the post-reproductive phase helps to ensure continued success. We are, all of us, the product of millions of years of hominin evolution, and we see the evidence of that in every day of our lives.